Okay, thank you for the introduction. I'm Tom Calloway. So this is uh, Lessons Learned, 10 Years of Motion Tracking for Mixed Reality. For those unfamiliar with Talus, we're a 63,000 employee French technology company. And while other parts of our business are out there, you know, funding SpaceX to launch great big things uh, up into space, my group has been working on mixed reality since the late 90s, 20 years actually. We were originally a startup called Intersense out of MIT. I've been uh, largely a principal engineer there for about 11 years. So many of you might have heard of Intersense. I've got some people. So I'm sharing some of our lessons learned. First, I'd like to make a few points on motion tracking for mixed reality. Just a few things I, I want to make sure don't get left out. Then I'll give you the lessons learned with anecdotes, some stories, and the obligatory slide on the future of AR. Right. First thing I'd like to point out is that motion tracking really does run the gamut from really, really nice to have to absolutely necessary uh, across the entire mixed reality uh, continuum. So, Real environments, we really want our GPS, we want our heading without any mixed reality. See-through AR is probably the most challenging of motion tracking. Video AR is next in the continuum. Augmented virtu virtual reality, if you're bringing physical objects into VR, uh, you really need to track well, and we all know we make people sick uh, if we don't track well in VR. And it's important to know, you know, among these six degrees of freedom you can track, the XYZ, roll, pitch, and yaw, uh, some degrees of freedom would be more important for different applications. If you have a deep sea diving augmented reality application, for example, maybe all you want is depth. Maybe that's the important thing, maybe depth and pitch. We've done some work motion tracking for GE Aviation. They build these aircraft engines, and what they really need there is 3 doff tracking for position only, to know where the tools are. They, they torque all these bolts, and if they miss a bolt during assembly, and then the, the aircraft engine blows apart during vibration. And then orientation on top of that is nice to have. Most of you are probably familiar that orientation tracking is kind of easy. You throw an IMU on there, and then we add position tracking on top of that. So it's important to know your application. We have a, a six degree of freedom pedestrian tracker, uh, largely used in defense. And we hold up a range finder and target something, and that extra degree of freedom of distance uh, now enables everyone with a network C through HMD to see that thing that was, you know, if it's a building, a burn, you know, a window in a burning building to go into. Uh, so there's, there's a lot going on with tracking. And here, there's all sorts of hardware and all sorts of algorithms. So, you know, if you're, if you're doing some kind of augmented reality solution, you might say, okay, let's get some gyros in Excel, and do I need a camera? Everyone's using depth sensors, I'll use depth sensors. It's very important from the very beginning to pick your hardware, and for whatever piece of hardware or combination of hardware you have, there's far more algorithms on top of that. So either consult, you know, experts, or get some people that are really willing to just open a book and learn, um, search around before you start with some some weak tracking because it, the difference between an excellent product and a crappy product could lie in just some subtle decisions you make early on with regards to motion tracking. Uh, so lots happened over the last 11 years. We've done tracking, you know, for those familiar with us, uh, many different applications. I tried to consolidate everything for time into three classes of lessons to remember. One is understand your user and your application from the very beginning. Don't just, you know, throw something together. Um, over and over again, uh, you're surprised when you get in front of the customer or the end application where it just doesn't work. So I've got some examples there. Know your environment and your technology very well, and don't settle. The third one's kind of cliche, but it's crucial. I've got some examples there. Uh, just with a little bit of extra effort, you can make your product much better. This first one was kind of interesting. This is know your user and your application. So we've done uh, motion tracking for firefighters. So we have this, our, our nav chip, inertial sensor we developed that's more, much more accurate than what you get in your, your smartphone and so forth. And they put this on their foot. We have these Zepting common filter algorithms. And basically, uh, we put them on their foot. They all fan out through the building or wherever they're going. And back in the truck, uh, someone can look at a display and like Harry Potter, see the footsteps of everyone walking through the, the building. So if someone, gets, if someone falls down or they need to coordinate, they can look at the footsteps and say, you there, you there, go rescue that person. They stopped responding. So we did a lot of walking and running and, you know, up and down stairs uh, in our offices, getting the algorithms tuned just right in Simulink, you know, and everything. And uh, then we went out there, and what did they do? Fortunately, we went early to find out what they do early. They don't even walk upstairs, from what I saw. They kick their way upstairs. So they, they see the first tread, and they go. And they literally kick the riser, then step. Kick the riser, then step. They get to the top, they stomp their feet. They kick their feet along the side. And I'm like, oh, no, my poor algorithms. Um, <laughs> and, and why do they do that? They don't want to fall through the floor, right? Um, so we, we found that, we found it early, we went back, made it robust against that, and even used that a little bit, because if you know just what the firefighter is doing, you can be more accurate. Now, you know, augmented reality is being added on top of that six degree of freedom foot localization for the head, and there are challenges there, you know, how are you going to track in the smoke, um, you know, in addition to heat and so forth. So know your user, go to them right away, so you don't develop technology in a vacuum. 
This is really the reason Intersense was acquired by Talus uh, several years back. We developed uh, a lower cost, higher precision, more robust optical inertial tracker for pilots. It's flying now very successfully, uh, F-16, A-10, helicopters in Europe and now South Korea. And uh, I remember the first flight test, uh, the, the test pilot was coming in, I'm all excited, a little bit nervous, you know, how's this gonna work? We had the installation done, and uh, they didn't send one pilot, they always send two pilots, like, like the Sith, right? <laughs> um, so there's one about seven feet tall, and one about five foot nothing. And, <laughs> and uh, you know, we had some little, we call them markers, you know, fiducial markers behind the pilot's head, and we designed it, it was working great for everyone we tried it on. The seven foot tall pilot was so tall that he could barely fit one fist in between there, so we had to make them a little more dense. The short pilot got in there, they were so far away, we needed to make them a little bit bigger, and she slouched, so we had to bring them forward. So because we got those two pilots at the extremes right at the beginning, um, and, and tweaked it right there, then it worked great, and now it works awesome for every pilot. You don't want to field something, and it works for the first five or six pilots, and you get one short pilot three months later, and they go up in the air, and they're dropping symbols, and they're you know, slaving target pod, and it just doesn't work. Uh, so know your, know your user right from the very beginning. Uh, similarly, for some of that, we're doing civilian uh, aviation stuff over in France. They're funding that. The FAA certification takes a while, but that's, that's one of my favorite AR apps. It looks really cool. But some of the aircraft navigation systems aren't very accurate, so we find ourselves trying to work around that. When you're dropping virtual runways on the ground and symbols, if your aircraft, you don't know where your aircraft is, you can't draw symbols out there. So um, it's working really well, but know your user and your application up front. And I'll also notice we do, you know, it's important to sometimes to do kind of a spiral development, prototype quickly, get in front of a user, find out what they do, find out what you did wrong, what you need to do. Don't develop something in a vacuum over the course of five or six years and find out you did it wrong. That's not my advice. Uh, so this is the last one on knowing your environment. This is our optical inertial. Uh, sorry, it's our acoustical inertial, ultrasonic inertial. So we have these ultrasonic transducers in the environment, and they chirp, and we estimate the air temperature, and we use the speed of sound and air to get these range measurements, and it uh, tracks very well. Millimeter precision in a, in a large area and so forth. It's kind of our bread and butter. That's a Stinger missile trainer, so it's like a VR dome, and they're shooting virtual missiles at virtual objects, and uh, it works great. Um, the, the Microphones have a 180 degree cone angle, and we could put lots of them on there, so we don't have occlusions and things like that. We had one customer that really liked our stuff, bought it for a weapons trainer, and they called us and said, this one system isn't working well, we don't know what's going on. So we sent a principal engineer down, he started unpacking his stuff, and uh, he found out quickly why he, they hadn't put earplugs in, because they were firing blanks and there were just massive explosions everywhere. Um, he'd never seen anything like it, so he had half unpacked his suitcase, and there's your problem. All of the microphones and ultrasonic sensors were completely swamped out with the sounds of explosions. Um, so know your, know your environment. And um, we had to switch to a different type of tracker uh, to get it working well. So even, even something that seems so robust it works anywhere, it could have you know, vulnerabilities. Uh, this is Don't Settle for Suboptimal Performance. This is an installation we did for the European Space Agency. This is their Mars rover. So we put these markers up on the ceiling, and uh, what they do is they command the robot to move some amount, turn some amount, and they need feedback to know if it's slipped on the Martian sand, how it's actually working. So we sighted this out, we put our little inside-out tracker on there, and we found during the installation that the tripod was slipping during sighting. And I couldn't go to these people with a straight face and say, I can't really sight this accurately, we're having trouble, you know, Martian sand is hard, <laughs> you know, you're gonna get a centimeter of accuracy, because these people are putting robots on other planets. Um, so we, <laughs> we brought in R&D, and we used our, our bundle adjustment, our photogrammetry, some stuff we've been working on for the, the high-end um, pilot stuff, and just by using our sensor taking pictures, we wind up getting more accurate results than we ever did for years of sighting using the Adelaide. And we since went and iterated on, you know, with granite calibration and all that stuff for the pilots, and we're getting the marker locations to about 20 microns um, RMS. So it's just, you know, you've all encountered this. You know, we could have stopped and said one centimeter tracking, that's all you need, right? Um, but just going the extra mile can really do a lot. So remember once again, understand you're using your application, know your environment and your technology, and don't settle for suboptimal performance. I see a lot of AR where the tracking kind of works, maybe it's tablet or something like that. Um, there'll be high latency, you'll move, things will swim around. Uh, sometimes it's not that hard, it's just making the right connections, seeing the right people, um, taking one little extra step in technology to get the tracking working really, really well. And that makes all the difference. So here's the, the obligatory slide. Uh, what are we doing now and where are we going? I know that my group is working on augmented reality anywhere. So we have this, this inside out monocular uh, image sensor and then the NavChip IMU we developed. 
and we're combining Vision Ocean Navigation and Monocular Slam, and we want to just be able to put on the small sensor that works in direct sunlight, works indoors, and they can just go walking. See through AR, uh, tablet AR, whatever it is, it just works. And um, th we got the relative tracking down. The, the research we're doing right now is getting a global coordinate frame so you can register your content. And we're at the state now where our content isn't just attached to some poster or something like that. We're defining all of our content with latitude, longitude, altitude. And envision a day where that's, that's how all your content is done. It's just fixed somewhere out there in the world, somewhere to a building. And uh, you know, how, how is this going to happen long term? Just throwing glasses and augmented reality always works registered. Uh, I got some predictions. Inertial sensors are going to keep getting better, and they'll dominate the approaches. You'll see little optical MEMS uh, before you know, too, too long. I've been waiting a while, but computational power will improve beyond Moore's law. Um, AR will, you know, utility will keep expanding. Interesting, for the last, I want to say, eight months, my team and I have been walking around our office with, with all this wearable stuff on. It's almost like the 90s sometimes with backpacks and all this, all this stuff. But we're, we're wearing the robot operating system on our bodies. We do lots of developments, model-based design, and Simulink. Um, but we find ourselves liking the visualization and the saving and all the utilities of the robot operating system. And what we're missing is, you know, the ability to, we're constantly wanting to change things and change the UI and then stop and restart and change modes. So we find ourselves adding GUIs onto the robot operating system. And it's interesting that, that ROS is sort of the best thing to wear right now when you're doing advanced AR. So if, if you know anyone from, you know, Apple, Microsoft, or Google, um, this is what we need. You know, a cyborg operating system that really does all these things for us and pieces everything together. Uh, timing is, is really important, I've found, for, with technology taking off. We have a, a lot of value, you know, a lot of revenue in, in high-end vertical markets for motion tracking and AR. But, you know, if you had the idea for the smartphone in the 1990s, so what? Right, the technology's not there. Um, I do think that, you know, over the next few years, you're finally starting to see this stuff come into place. Um, we were there in 1996, the first VR hype cycle. And looking back, I don't know how it was so hyped up when today's $600 graphics card destroys the world record-holding supercomputer back then. And uh, even today, we need a little bit more computing power. All right, got one minute, so one more slide. Uh, finally, uh, you know, if you haven't seen this, I recommend it. It's just a fun slide, but don't do this. Uh, <laughs> just, just don't. You know, our, our, our predecessors had to worry about you know atomic bombs and so forth. This is what keeps me up at night: getting motion tracking working anywhere where you know where you're going, and then people do this. So uh, please come see our booth. We have a bunch of you know tracking demos, and we're not just coming up with solutions. We really are selling tracking technology. We're consulting. If you're doing some kind of solution, we'll give advice or whatever it is. So swing by our booth. Thank you.